be back up and stick with us because you never know what might be on your screen when we return to you. once again and I will redo the entire introduction word for word. You missed out, you know. You missed out on a really fantastic introduction. Jandre even sang for us, but that is not the best part. No, no Jandre. No, Jandre. And Jandre has been singing, <laughs> serenading me. And as I said first thing this morning, which of course none of you got to hear, was that Jandre has a complete um, repertoire of the world's worst songs. A permanently etched in his brain and now permanently etched in mine. Good morning, my name is Jamie and I clearly have Jandre on camera with me. Morning. There you go. Steph is out with Gert and we do sincerely apologize for the gremlins that we seem to experience at the start of every show. It is a mystery to us why the gremlins have suddenly decided to follow such a set pattern that's very contrary to their usual behavior. Usually it's completely unpredictable when they're going to strike. But it seems over the last few days to have sort of settled into something of a routine. Uh, we are heading out, coming to you live actually, better, better do this part, from Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains Game Reserve in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park of South Africa. Not only are we live, but we're also... What was that? Was that a yawn? <laughs> I'm pouring you! <laughs> That was Jandre, by the way. <laughs> um, he has heard this many, many, many times. Um, you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through on questions at wildearth.tv. Let's try and see if we can't find something to keep Jandre entertained this morning. So, Steph and myself following up frantically on Lions Roaring. <laughs> Canada Keith has solved, solved our technical problems. Canada Keith says, can't we put repeaters upon giraffes? We could absolutely, Canada Keith, or we could get Brent to, to walk around like this with a repeater. Pretty much the same thing. We did chat yesterday with our giraffe, in our giraffe sighting, when one of the viewers asked about the antennas on the top of a giraffe's head. So absolutely, I feel as though that is an entirely feasible suggestion as a way of solving our tech problems. Steph, I found your lion tracks. Steph's off the vehicle, by the way, tracking lions. I've got his tracks here. <laughs> Sorry, Steph. Mm, now they've gone again. Maybe they're not as fresh as I thought they were. Hmm. Everybody keep your eyes peeled for lions and or Steph wandering through the bush. No, there's the lion tracks. So you all missed poor Steph's introduction. He did a lovely introduction during which he showed you lion tracks. These lion tracks are going in completely the wrong direction. The lions have been playing games with us over the last few days. Oof, they're not very clear. They're not very clear at all. Okay, that's me told. <laughs> they're not very clear. No, they're not. Zooms out. <laughs> He's right though, they are impossible for you guys to see and they're impossible for Jardre to show you. I'll try and find a better set. It's difficult, the sun's in the wrong place. There you go. Is that better? Not really. It's a bit too early in the morning. Shame, you guys missed a spectacular sunrise. There's our lion tracks wandering along the road. There you go, you can see them. You can definitely see those ones. <laughs> Shall I get out? Uh, hold on a moment, I will get out. I just, I'm stuck with my hot water bottle under my jacket. Here we go. It's okay, I'll get there eventually. Okay, so for newer viewers, which set are we looking at? This one? Uh, whichever you want. Whichever we want. Oh, fantastic, I've got the pick of the lot. So the line tracks that we're looking at are here, which can be relatively difficult to see if you are unfamiliar with what lion tracks actually look like. But this is the back of this lion's foot with its three lobes. I am of course naturally artistic, so this is come out, going to come out beautifully. Here's one toe, here's another toe. That was sarcasm by the way. My art, my art teacher very t kindly told me not to f carry on with art throughout school. Lion tracks, big lion tracks, can give you a sense of scale. Here's my hand. 
next to his footprint, my beautifully traced footprint. It's the size of my hand. Uh, it's actually a little bit bigger than my hand. So male lion walked south down this road, and we're going to go find him. He was calling all through the night until about 2 o'clock in the morning when he went silent. And the Nkuhumas picked up where he left off and continued to roar throughout into the morning. And I think we need to go and follow up on where this lion was. Okay. Tuck the hot water bottle back under the jacket. Bear with me a moment. It's not actually that cold. Nearly there. It's all gone wrong. It's all gone wrong. There we go. Much better. Oh, apparently, it was... Actually, it's been so long since we first set out, I can't even remember what the temperature was meant to be officially. It's probably around 11 degrees, so sitting around 51 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, my apologies, it was 13 and 56 when we set out this morning. So a positively balmy winter's morning here in the African bush. And as we spoke about earlier, but of course you all missed it, which is very most tragic, was the fact that it's too warm for July which means that July is going to be up to its usual tricks and is going to trick us into thinking it's summer and then freeze. By the way, the beanie situation is very sad, it's very tragic. There you go, Justin's thinking along the same lines I am as I fix my ridiculous beanie, my ever so flattering beanie. Um, Justin, yes, a fluffy pom-pom was cleaned. There's something running. Oh, hyena! Yay! No, where'd you go? I haven't seen a hyena in ages. Hello. Where have you been? And why are you looking so nervous? Where are the lions? Yay! I haven't seen our hyenas in what feels like forever. Hey, isn't this Gwen? Hello. No, it's not. Definitely not. Sorry, my mistake, I got overexcited. Look at this little guy. Half the right ear gone. Who on earth is this? And no tail. No tail and half an ear. Shame, buddy. You've been through the wars. Oh dear, I can't possibly stay with it, I'm afraid. This is the most impossible section. How interesting was that? I wonder... Those of you who are familiar with the hyenas before my time, which hyena was that? Was that the hyena that got caught up in that terrible fight with Scott? Where'd it go? Oh, I can't follow it, I'm sorry. Mm. Oh dear, it has completely vanished into the thick of the drainage. It's been so long since we saw a spotted hyena, I feel positively joyful at that sighting. Absolutely no idea which hyena that was. Hey, there you go, you little mischief. I see you. It's, um, no, you won't be able to see it, I don't think. Change direction completely. Right, back, back towards it. It's not a hyena I'm familiar with, and it's not, it's not a hundred percent comfortable with vehicles. You can see it in its body language, that sideways head bob that a lot of the predators do when they are trying to decide how they feel about the vehicle. Most of you will be aware by now, but for new viewers who haven't seen hyenas in a long time, the spotted hyena is my favorite predator. I find them absolutely 100% the most fascinating thing that we get out here. Just because of their social structure. It is so intensely complex. Hyena came through here. There he is. Got him. 
some awesome information coming through from Crystal. Oh my goodness. It's okay, little one. See, he's not comfortable with vehicles at all. And in fact, I'm not even entirely sure he's comfortable in this particular area. I wonder if he is one of the nomadic males. Because apparently he's been seen on cheetah planes once. He's been seen stealing a kill from quarantine, and this is only the fourth time we've ever seen him. I'm almost guaranteed that it's a male. I'm not going to chase him, by the way. I'm going to come around the corner and just see if he's relaxed a bit. But I don't think it's just us. I think the fact that there's lions somewhere here, um, and that... I don't know. I, I don't necessarily think he's in a foreign clan's territory, but I'm not entirely sure where he comes from. I can tell you that he's been seriously beaten up, and it looks like he's been beaten up by the rest of the clan. He is not going to let us any closer. Hey, buddy. Missing tail, half an ear. The injuries that hyenas are capable of inflicting upon each other can be incredibly serious. But it just goes to show how resilient these animals actually are, which is something we talk about all the time. The fact that they have this ability to heal without antibiotic or any such treatment. trotting down into the drainage system. I'm going to try and keep with him, but follow at a distance. Uh, Chris Rogue has said she's got no idea either. We'll call him the Mystery Hyena from Elephant Plains, or we'll call him No-Tail, the Mystery Hyena, from Elephant Plains or Arethusa. Perhaps, yeah. He's very interesting. I've never seen that hyena before. At least I, I'm relatively certain I've personally never seen him. I'm sure he's been seen on the live safaris before. Man, no wonder he's so nervous then. If you if you're suggesting if he's from Elephant Plains or from Arethusa area, then he is definitely going to be a bit nervous in the heart of the Juma clan territory. But I haven't seen weirdly I haven't seen a single hyena track while I've been out this morning apart from his, which is unusual. Makes me wonder where our clan really have wandered off to. Perhaps they're trying to raid a kill somewhere. Luckily we've got the really subtle breaks of Rusty to carry us forward. Oh, whoops. Oh, my whoopsie. I shouldn't actually be on the damn wall. <laughs> whoops, that was a total mistake. My mistake. Hello, guests. I'm sorry. No, they must be out on drive, surely. No, they must be. They can't possibly still be here. I don't see the hyena anywhere. He has scarpered. Hmm. What an interesting way to start a morning. Thought perhaps he might be going for a drink. Oh well. We're here anyway. We might as well carry on. Whoopsie. Now the guests must be out by now. Hope they weren't deciding to have a late morning start. The, what I, basically what I'm saying here is that uh, we drive, uh, we don't drive right in front of the lodge when there are guests in camp. So first thing in the morning or on our afternoon drive we drive around rather than straight in front of them. In my sheer excitement in seeing that hyena I kind of forgot about that. But that's okay. It was, a, it was an entirely accidental thing. I, I completely forgot that we were tracking lions as well. So, 
a new hyena to add to our list. One that I have not seen before. I always enjoy seeing new animals. Oh, isn't it nice to see a hyena once again? It does feel like it's been a really, really long time. That's true, we also haven't had a hyena visitor in camp for a long time. I wonder, that our whole clan seems to have shifted. I don't even think Gwen's around anymore, to be completely honest with you. I haven't seen... We used to see her tracks every single day, walking around outside, and I haven't seen them for a long time. Well, I say long time, three days, which feels like a really long time. We haven't heard them. That Nyala carcass wasn't found, the one that we saw yesterday on the Sunset Safari, that was finished off by vultures rather than hyenas. It seems as though our clan have temporarily abandoned us, which I'm going to try not to take personally. I don't know why they've all gone running into Manuleti. What? Maybe? You know what? I suppose there's a potential that the lions, the, the, the amount of time that the Inkahumas have been spending here might have something to do with that move. Because they have moved, most definitely. Okay, our, our hyena has dashed away. He's gone into the drainage system. So into the river system that runs close to the dam. I don't want to follow him too much because he clearly isn't comfortable with vehicles. I don't want to pressure him. But we did have a nice view of it. But he has managed to escape us. Alrighty, right, should we try this again, Jardre? <laughs> Hold on, let's wait for Steph to finish off on the Game Drive channel before I do his fantastic introduction once again. It's a pity you missed it the first time round. It loses its magic the second time round, but we'll keep it going. We'll keep it rolling. I'm just waiting for him to finish off his update on the Game Drive channel. Okay, right. Some say he was raised by a friendly family of battaliers. Others say that he can see in multiple spectrums of light, which is why he's so fantastic at finding scorpions. All we know is we call him Steph. <laughs> this team is a worrying team, I must be honest with you. I don't quite know what's going on with them this morning. Well, some news on those lion tracks. They definitely cross back into Juma chasing some buffalo. I just spent the last sort of 10 or 15 minutes briskly walking with all my senses extended in the bush. And from the looks of things, some buffalo were chased from Buffelzook into Juma, chased across the road over here, and a male and a, and a female lioness were, in, were, were, were chasing them into this block and across. Male lions tracks become a bit indistinct. Male lions when they run their paws spread literally to wider than my hand and with their big toes they leave very little scuff marks. So quite tough to actually see exactly where those, those where his tracks go. The females tracks join a game path and are trotting behind the buffalo. So I think if we can find the buffalo we stand a pretty good chance of finding these line. At least they're not sitting north of our boundary or off of our boundary that we know of. And now it's just a question of following up where we are. So that's what I've been doing for the last 10 minutes is walking around in the bush tracking these lions escapades from last night. The buffalo dung that I found was very fresh. I still hadn't even it hadn't even begun to cool down yet which means that those buffalo are still quite close, and of course, the lion tracks being right behind the buffalo is what I'm hoping for here. So the, they were running pretty much parallel to where we are right now, about 200 or 300 yards off to my right hand side.
Pulls a dam. And so, you know, I would say that you're going to find some references to the earliest human beings being found in Africa. How long ago that was, I'm not too sure. And exactly at what phase in the evolution of human, of, of Homo sapien that was, I'm not too sure either. Um, but you're welcome to send whatever answers you can find through to questions at Wild Earth TV, and I'll please gladly share it with the rest of the viewers during today's game drive, or even this afternoon's, or tomorrow's, whenever you feel like it. See if I've got something in my box of tricks here that can help us with that. You can have a look inside here with me. I have, I don't know if you've noticed, it creates a bit of a short circuit in me every now and again. I must look all cross-eyed. Whenever that happens, it is disconcerting. Alright. Let's have a look and see where he comes out. They tend to walk, this is very thick bush here for a male lion to walk in. So I'm quite certain that his tracks are probably still on the, on the road in front of us. They like to walk in these open patches and then they go over the grassy areas. Very rarely will you find a lion walking through the thickest bush. You do find it, of course, but it's rare. They're quite big, they're bulky, they step on thorns all the time. Alright, I think while we decipher at the next junction, we're going to have to decipher which way this male lion walked. It would be a good time to go to Jamie, who's probably got an update on what she's been up to for you. See you just now. Well, in a somewhat devastating turn of affairs, the hunting lions decided to catch the buffalo, or managed to catch the buffalo, not decided to catch the buffalo. They have caught the buffalo on Buffel's Hook, just, just north of our boundary. Um, and, and where we've been looking the entire time, where Steph was off the vehicle tracking, they were indeed chasing buffalo. They have chased it completely off into Buffel's Hook, where they are currently feeding upon it. There's three females and one male, so that doesn't preclude a chance for us to see lions. There's always the chance. There is another male somewhere here, or one of the females. I'm going to keep helping Steph try to follow up. I'm going to go and check Buffel's Hook Dam in the hope that they are going to pop out somewhere here. We might actually meet up with Steph in a moment. And since he was coming along down Hyena Road towards Central, I haven't seen any lion tracks here. I did see lion tracks going back north on Gari Cut Line. Remember when I pulled over and said these tracks are going the wrong way? Um, and I think, this, I think the male lion that we're tracking has turned around and gone to that buffalo kill. Oh dear! And it sounds as though it's a very, very recent kill as well. <laughs> oh well, such is life. For those of you who aren't understanding what exactly what we mean by this, there are certain places where we can't go in the reserve. There's certain places where everybody can't go in this reserve. Um, and one of those places is Buffel's Hook. So the rest of the vehicles in this area can drive there. We unfortunately cannot because, well, for lots of reasons, but we can't drive there, which means we can't go to that lion kill, which means we have to focus on finding our own lions. It's fine. We'll find our own lions as we go along. We'll see what else we can find. Oh, well. Such is life. There's still Karula to find, of course, and Herbert is on the tracks of a male leopard. So perhaps for now, I'm going to abandon the lion search and go and turn it into a leopard search for this morning. I'm going to see whether there's any sign of Karula making her way back into Juma. Oh, I was going to tell you about that. Last night on our way home, there's tracks here. This is female. The lioness walking along this road. Hold on. Before we abandoned our lion search completely, I'm sure this must be the lioness going back to the cubs. These are fresh, fresh. Hold on. Let us change our mind for a moment. There go the tracks there. Hopefully she is on her way back to okay there's a couple of tracks here just bear with me one moment 
I just need to try and work this out. Because I think I see a male's tracks as well. That looks like male tracks to me. I'm not going to stop and do another lion track segment, but it is very interesting. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Not delay too long because they're heading straight east towards our boundary. My beanie is once again looking very special on the top of my head. Steph for Jamie. Wait for an opportunity to chat to Steph. Okay, they've cut straight east. They've gone off the road, but they usually do. Animals walking along this road usually do. They cut the corner. Steph is in Kunzo for one Mufazi and one Madora going east on Central Road at the Nyala Road Junction. They've just gone off the road. I'm going to try to follow up as to where they've crossed out. That didn't make any sense. Sorry, Steph. Yeah, I got him. Thank you. Okay, still on central going east. Okay. Where, oh where, are these lions? Is this, I don't think, is the same pair. Oh, this might actually be the mating pair that we've been searching for for the last five or so days. <laughs> to the point that it's getting ridiculous. They've gone off the road again. What's your position, Steph? Okay, copy. Um, I don't know if you want to take Nyala Road north, see if they're coming out towards Bufflesook Dam. getting Steph's help here. All right, we're doing a U-turn because the tracks have gone off the road and I just want to see whether they're going north or south before I send Steph in completely the wrong direction. Where, oh where, have these lions gone? <laughs> Aubrey, thanks for your message of support for the beanie <laughs> and welcome on our sunrise safari. Aubrey wants to know how you tell the difference between a male lion track and a female lion track and the answer Aubrey is just size. Size is the giveaway. Sorry Aubrey, I would like to show you a good example but I've driven over the best spot and I just want to see where these lions have gone because they've gone off the road here looks as though they're going north it does look as though they're going north okay oh yeah definitely going north okay perfect that's all I needed to do was just double check that they were coming in this direction so Aubrey just quickly in terms of scale I know that my hand is not perhaps the best thing a male lion track is the size just actually just a little bit larger than the size of my hand. A lioness track will come sort of up to my first knuckles in terms of size. There's a and they're also much narrower and the toes are sort of almost in a more even proportion to the back pad than the male lions. Male lions have kind of small looking toes actually compared to the back pad of their foot and their toes tend to be a bit more spread out but generally it's just size so even just listening even a young lion male lion will have feet that are much much bigger than a female because of course bear in mind that a male lion carries an extra that's on top of the female's weight carries an extra 200 pounds at least or 220 pounds of weight so he is much, much heavier 
than she is, and as a result, obviously, his feet are bigger. He's much, much bigger. And that, I mean, that for him is a, an advantage in terms of fighting. It's an advantage that he, he needs. But at the same time, it also means that it's one of the reasons why lionesses do a great deal of the hunting. It's not to say that male lions can't hunt, and they definitely do. But lionesses tend to be more agile, and they don't overheat as quickly. These lions are somewhere here. If it is the mating pair, that is interesting. So the last time we saw this mating pair of lions, they, the female had suckle marks. We always suspected that there were three sets of Nkuhuma cubs, and we had two of the mothers on, at a different sighting, and then we had the female mating with the male, or Brent had the female mating with the male. And we've been trying to work out if it is whether or not she's lost her cubs and come back into estrus or false estrus or if her hormones have confused him. But while we try to concentrate a little bit on figuring out where these lions have gone because they have gone off the road completely, let's go back across to Steph and find out how his search is going. Yes, we're busy running a tracking system here today, second to none, myself and Jamie. Working as a team, working with all the other rangers in the area here, trying to figure out exactly what the puzzle is and where they're going and what they're up to and everything else needed to do that. Not the easiest thing, I must be honest. And that's because, quite literally, we spread a bit thinly over this particular property. I know sometimes it doesn't feel like it. It seems like every second road you turn down, there's a car with another set of rangers. But when you're trying to do everything on your own or just with two people, it does take some time to decipher where those trails are going. You literally can just work one road and then another road. Then you've got to come back and figure out where they crossed into the block, where they missed the block. It's quite difficult to do. Hence, me saying and have believed for many years that a very robust tracking team made up of skilled trackers in an area like this is just invaluable. I was lucky enough at some point in my career to work with probably the world's most experienced tracking team, professional commercial tracking team. And very rarely have I come across a team of such professional gentlemen who were so supremely skilled at that craft, could work together and quickly, quickly unravel a mystery in probably some of the most difficult trekking terrain that you can find in Africa. Very rocky hills, very little sand substrate, very little vegetation. And yet these magicians would pull out the most amazing sightings and just keep on performing all the time. So what we've done now is Jamie had the tracks of those male and female. She had them on Central Road and basically we are running now parallel to Central Road but on the other side of a large-ish drainage line that splits between the two roads. Now what I have got on the road in front of us, lots of buffalo tracks moving up and down here, not so fresh. And buffalo are a favorite food of these Birmingham boys. Uh, I re recall just a couple of months ago hearing a story from a neighboring property that said that they managed to kill, I think it was seven or nine buffalo in one night between five male lions. I mean, that's carnage, but it just goes to show that they're very good at hunting buffalo. So wherever they grew up, those boys on the farm, just on the Bir on, on I think it was on Birmingham, up north of Manyaleti, there must have been lots of buffalo there. I know the Timbavati River runs through there and it's well known for being buffalo infested. Lots of stories throughout the ages of the Timbavati River and its buffalo herd. I'm driving very slowly so that it gives me enough time to check every game path and to make sure I don't miss a sign going across the road. This is very close to where we saw that female elephant missing the tip of her trunk uh, yesterday with a youngster. 
that six month old baby. I wonder if she's still in the area. Nice to know how far they sort of move in one night here. Wow, and we have an answer on our question, I think it was James that sent it through to us, about when people first came into Africa. Oh, Jill, sorry, Jill had asked this, and the answer is a hominid called Lucy at 3.2 million years ago. Lucy was apparently the closest sort of form to our current form if you believe in evolution and her name was Lucy and she occurred in Africa about 3.2 million years ago it was one of the very first so I hope that answers your question it's a long long time ago ah So Edward has just added to that particular comment saying that Homo sapiens popped up about 2 million years ago in our current form, Homo sapiens, and then walked out of Africa about 100,000 years ago. So all pointing towards the fact that, you know, it hasn't been that long. I mean, considering the fact that a shark or a tortoise has been around for 200 million years, being around for 3.2 million years might sound like a lot, but it's not really. It's just a flash in the pan. Now, there's a couple of analogies using a length of string a mile long, and humans are only the last millimeter in, the, in, in, the, in terms of the, the Earth's um, age, and dinosaurs are the last, oh, I don't know what the, what the whole thing is, but it's actually quite interesting to see that we've had such a massive effect on our planet in such a very, very short space of time. We've been able to colonize almost every single part of it. We are able to utilize almost everything on it. And it's just very interesting to see that, you know, in the Earth's history, I suppose when the dinosaurs were walking around, the Tyrannosaurus thought that, what could be better than me? I suppose in another, let's say, 100 million years, obviously with the gift of foresight, or hindsight, I should say, we'd be able to say, Wow, can you imagine what's going to be walking around then? It's not really quite difficult. Right, now there were some lion tracks that came out on the road now walking in the opposite direction. Now, I don't quite know if they're fresh or not. It's difficult to say. See, you can see that there's something walking around. I'm just looking for a place where I can pull over and have a proper look. Ah, oh, no. Only the ever-present hyena, must be honest, I think I, at least an, a hyena walks over or across or on every single road at Juma every single day. They cover the most exceptional distances. I heard a book, or well, I read a book once that referred to hyenas being able to cover 60 kilometers in a night. I think that's a little bit exaggerated 60 kilometers is a long long way for a single animal to walk that needs to find food drink water scent mark interact with a clan i think 60 kilometers even at a full sprint would be difficult to cover but even if it's somewhere close to that it's still an ex exceptional amount of kilometers for an animal to cover in one single day they're definitely built for endurance built for those long distance tricks searching for food I don't think they need to walk that far in this particular area I think with the amount of leopard that we have here they definitely are not going to be shy for food that's for sure what is that ah it's Jamie <laughs> I thought it was an elephant <laughs> I think the last
last thing on earth that Jamie could be compared to would be an elephant, the waif of a girl. At least I still know that we're working together. <laughs> Alright, I think since we've seen Jamie, let's see what she's been up to while we've been talking. We're going to send you over to Jamie and catch up with you in a bit. Now that is definitely the first time I've ever been mistaken for an elephant. Definitely a first. Hello Steph, wherever you are. <laughs> I've been trying to get a moment to speak to Steph on the Game Drive channel, but I have to be honest with you, I've given up. I can't, I can't even get a word in edgeways at this point, and I'm actually going to turn it down a little bit because it's drilling through my brain. No, we've got the lioness. The lioness and the male lion tracks popped out around this road, and Steph will find them now, which is why I'm not too concerned about my inability to reach him on the Game Drive comms, because I know he's going to find them. He's going to, he'll see the tracks as well. The difficulty is that somebody's driven along this road. In fact, somebody's driven along the, around this whole area. So these lions, I think they're somewhere here, unless they've decided to go along Buffel's Hook Cut Line and go back to towards where that kill is. That is entirely possible. So it's just trying to puzzle out exactly what it is they're doing. So I'm going to do one more loop of Bufflesook Dam and then I'm going to start heading back further to, to the southern area of the reserve to see what we can find there. I'm hoping to encounter Karula since yesterday she walked right up to the vehicle and gave us such, David, it was just Dave and myself having a wonderful time as she walked up, looked at us, looked at Dave, looked at me and then went in front of the car and used us to hunt a group of Impala. She wasn't successful with them, but she was very clearly on a mission. I think we're going to go and look for her after a little bit. Take ourselves out of this search for these mystery lions. But let's just go and do one more check around the dam and one more check around the den site. Glancing nervously at the water's edge from the opposite side. <laughs> can, you hear the, can you hear the upset Franklin? <laughs> that, that was because the Inyala gave them a fright. And the favour was reciprocal because the Franklin actually scared the Inyala as well. Hmm? Oh wow! Fish eagle! I haven't seen a fish eagle in ages! Well done, Jandre. Incredible camera work. Where'd he go? Oh, there. Awesome. Busy grooming and putting all his feathers in place. You can see how they're ruffling in the wind. The wind is picking up, slowly bringing with it that chance of the cold front on its way towards us. I feel as though the, the fish eagle, the African fish eagle, has one of the most impossible calls to imitate. I said that once on drive and Brian promptly proved me completely wrong by doing a perfect impression of one. I cannot do it. It's a high-pitched whistling cry that is beautiful to hear. Chandra? Oh, hold on. Line audio. Huh. The lions are still here, everybody. No, 
Now, where on earth did that come from? <coughs> that sounded... Let's just wait and see if they call again. <laughs> Squirrel, you're a bit behind the times. It's alarm calling at the fish eagle. The elephants just found the lions. You can hear them trumpeting away. And one very, very angry squirrel. Don't you think a squirrel alarm call sounds like a witch's cackle? Ah, the cacophony of morning life at a dam. Come on, Fish Eagle, we need you to give us a call as well. Such a beautiful bird. Sorry guys, I'm just listening really, really intently to hear whether or not we can hear the lions roaring once again. The wind is gusting, so it might be distorting the sound slightly, but I would guess at somewhere around mm, central, where we've just come from. I think that we were very, very close to finding them. And it's probably the female actually trying to relocate the rest of her pride. So we're in a good position because she'll probably walk in a direct line towards us to go towards that kill. I wonder if Steph heard it. Our beautiful fish eagle is giving himself a jolly good groom first thing in the morning. I really want to go and see if I can't find where these lions were roaring from. But while we head across in that direction, let's go across to Steph, who's got one of the most beautiful antelope. Jamie's not wrong there. I also find the Nyala to be one of the most beautiful antelope that we have out here. The two of them here. Two beautiful bulls, and they are trying what it seems like to eat the fruits of the fallen green thorn or this torchwood, picking up what they can off of the ground. They're generally browsers, they don't eat grass, even though at the moment it does look like they are. And these are two youngsters, and I know that they're young because the tips of their horns, the last inch or so of their horns, face one another. They're not parallel to one another and they're not splayed apart from one another the last inch or so of their horns hopefully this one will turn towards us oh there you go and it just dispels it that one is a little bit parallel he's a little bit older than this other one this one that's hiding himself behind the tree here he's a youngster i'll show you now as soon as he gets himself out from behind the tree there you go you can just see those horn tips there pointing towards one another. A young Nyala, frantically picking up some leaves. I think what's happened is the wind is perhaps blowing some leaves off of the trees and they're picking up the fallen leaves. There's this bank of cloud that has developed off to our south, a very ominous looking cloud. It feels the temperature has dropped a bit. It feels like there's a cold front on the way. But in any case, it's not going to change the outcome much of any of this. All right. So, what I think we do, let's make our way, carry on making our way down this road. This is Central Road. I know Jamie has just heard these lions giving a contact call to one another. We've also just heard an elephant here somewhere. 
And um, so there's all, it's all happening. Just a matter of trying to find it. That's it. I'll show you this bank of clouds as soon as we can get into a, a more open place. And you can see it basically there in front of us over there. You'll see, there you go. That, basically from that horizontal branch all the way down to the horizon, is a thick band of cloud. It's going to be nice to see exactly what is going on here, what transpires through the day. Tonight me might be a very windy night. And with these cold fronts brings a very big fire danger. It's often here towards the end of the dry season that we get these fires developing. He's very warm winds that come off the Drakensberg and then blow across here in answer to the cold fronts beckoning and then just takes a tiny little spark could be anything it could be pops of methane gas in uh, termite mounds I've heard someone say that once to just being a little bit careless with uh, anything from fireplaces to lighting whatever The sound of that elephant came from here somewhere. Probably closer to the drainage line. This area in front of us is renowned for elephant and elephant activity. Lots of sort of early swish marks on the floor here. Let's go down this road a little bit and go and see. <laughs> There's a new viewer that's joined us with the most epic um, Twitter handle, Ghost of Jiminy Cricket. You've just joined us for the first time. Well, welcome aboard. And basically, you've just asked, what is this whole safari life thing? What's going on here? Well, Ghost of Jiminy Cricket, you basically have just joined the world's largest safari vehicle. It's live, which means that what I'm looking at right now is what you're looking at literally just a couple of seconds later. And I'm going to prove that to you now by showing you a kudu, which I've just spotted as you were speaking to me. We are located in South Africa, right in the Kruger National Park, its largest game reserve. We are on the western side of that game reserve in a privately owned piece of it called the Sabi Sand Viltain. And there is a female kudu that has just come out from that thicket and is now about to camouflage itself with that tree. So welcome. That is uh, your first animal. If you just joined us right now and stumbled onto the website now, we have many in our community that have been coming on Game Drive with us for many, many, many years. And I'm sure you'll see from all the social media activity that there's a very thriving community there that will... I'm sure welcome you with open arms and you'll quickly come to learn that we have in our area we've got we share what we drive around in with some animal characters and some some animals that we see on a regular basis lion and leopard most notably elephant certain buffalo certain kudu certain impala and basically we go out twice a day for three hour stints twice a day in the mornings here and in the afternoons and we try and find these animals and share their lives with you 
And we do this as unobtrusively as possible and with as much care and attention given to the animals here. This is their home. This is We live here, but this is their home. Now from Kudu to the other, I wouldn't quite go so far as calling it a giant antelope, but definitely a large antelope. The other one that occurs out here is waterbuck, and Jamie has some for you. Slowly walking off into Torchwood, I, it seems to be the pattern of the Jamie Steph game drive that we um, we stop at Waterbuck. We seem to find all the Waterbuck and Kudu in our Traverse area between the two of us. And today is proving to be no different. We have lots and lots of Waterbuck for you and lots and lots of Kudu. Oh, there's the lion again. Earpiece out. Torchwood. Oh dear. And just by the way, obviously I'm trying to listen by making myself look like a ridiculous human being, but um, just by the way, the lines are not visible from our cut line. They're visible from a cut line, but that cut line is outside of our traverse area. So either way, we couldn't actually go to that kill even if we wanted to. It's a little bit further to the east. Of course we wanted to. Um, just hold on, because this lion is on. He's very close to the cheetah cut line boundary, but he's... Ah, I think our lion is, that's been calling the whole time is outside of our boundary. <laughs> Oh dearie me, I think it's time to abandon the lion search and move on. <laughs> Our waterbuck are also not really playing particularly well towards the camera. They've all hidden behind the raisin bushes and the various combretum trees with their fluffy fur and white rings highlighting their bottoms. The famous story, of course, is that they sat upon freshly painted toilet seats. And that's why the waterbuck has a ring around its bottom and that the hyenas have been laughing at it ever since. It's one of those random little just so stories. Since our waterbuck haven't aren't any closer to us and they have kind of disappeared, I do want to move on. I want to just go a little bit further south along Cheetah Cut Line, maybe, just maybe, on our eastern boundary of where we can drive our lions. Oh, our lion will pop out and give us a roar. So while we go searching for him, Steph has found the animal that we were listening to earlier, which is a squirrel. I have found a squirrel indeed sunning itself on a marula, bra on a marula uh, stem. A southern tree squirrel as we call them here, the only squirrels that we find here. And have a look at this guy stretching himself out in the sun. They do that. I have a squirrel at home, actually. My wife rescued a squirrel that had been abandoned after falling out of a nest. As a young squirrel, and I've had the pleasure and sometimes displeasure of hosting the squirrel in my house for the last six months or so. And I tell you, these little guys are some of the most characterful animals I've ever come across in my life. I have no doubt that the squirrel is sunning itself. My squirrel at home does exactly the same thing. Spends a vast portion of the day... Oh, now has disappeared. <laughs> of course. Anyway, my squirrel spends a vast portion of the day doing exactly that. Sunning itself on the bed and in the house and on the couch and then interspersing its time of rest and sleeping on my couch by chewing everything that my house is. I think given enough time, luckily they don't live for very long, but I think given an infinite timeline, my squirrel would absolutely eat my entire house, including everything and everyone in it. <laughs> oh, but anyway, they are very, very characterful. 
I quite enjoy my squirrel. It went through a patch of wanting to eat me alive. I think while it was deciding what it liked in its diet, and I used to return here to camp after my weekend's way with many bloody gaping wounds from the squirrel, although it, for some reason it's decided that it doesn't like meat anymore and now it doesn't bite me as much. Twitter handles are coming in fast and strong today. Welcome to Fuzzman Sparkles. Wow, you have to let us know how you came up with that name. Fuzzman, you asked me what species of squirrel that was. That was the southern tree squirrel, the southern tree squirrel. And that is the only squirrel that we find here. Not the only rodent we find here, but the only squirrel that we find here. Relatively abundant. They live in these small family groups made up of a mom and dad and then successive generations of youngsters the most of which I've seen is probably around about five to six and they live in a small little territory and uh, basically will forage anything that they can find they eat almost anything insects they love termites they love fruit they love vegetables they love seeds Uh, these lions, I tell you, I don't quite know what to make of them. They're driving me insane. I found the tracks of those lions that Jamie can hear. Let's see where they go. For those of you who are just joining us, we've been basically running around in circles trying to find lions. that have been keeping us awake literally non-stop since about 12 o'clock last night. They've been roaring their heads off and we've managed to track them literally footprint for footprint from our houses where we stay to right here where I am now. This is the last place that I found some footprints right there. For the life of me, I can't imagine what these lions are busy doing. They have the ability to walk around in circles, especially when they're hunting or they're trying to find one another or for some reason or another they have just decided to run around in circles. On a windy day like today, lions make the most of the wind by basically hunting into the wind as much as what they can. And that is, I think, what's been happening here. Now the reason why I switched off is because Jamie has been hearing contact calls from a female lioness coming from this particular area. This is the last place that she had tracks of those lions. I think what I'm going to do is just sit here for a few minutes to see if we can hear anything. The sound of the cars, although these cars are incredibly quiet, the sound of these cars does hamper our ability to hear in the bush most of the time. And so by switching the car off, I'm able to listen to alarm calls, these contact calls, hopefully sound from somewhere close by and so that's what we're going to do just switch off and listen just for a bit have a look at the bush around us beautiful little thicket of combretums with an enormous termite mound off to our left hand side there's this big termite mound much bigger than my car And while I think we sit and listen, I think we're going to send you over to Jamie, who's probably got an update on what she's been busy with. And a very big welcome to the kids at the Egg Coraleni Center in the... Oh, sorry, just checking for footprints. It's wonderful to have you here with us on a safari vehicle. So I want to make sure that you imagine that you're on the back of the car looking at all of these amazing animals that live very, very close to where you do. Uh, what animal would you like to see today? Let's see if we can't figure out exactly 
what you want to see and maybe we can find some lions in Mangala or perhaps we find some in Love. We must go look and see whatever it is we can find. At the moment though all of the animals are hiding away trying to keep themselves hidden behind bushes and trees waiting for it to get a bit warmer to come out into the sun. Now you've got to look carefully see if you can find the signs of the animals walking through this area. Steffi's listening for the lion roaring. We're looking for a leopard today. We're going to go see if we can't find a leopard that I saw last night walking along the road looking for something to eat. And don't forget, while you're watching, you can also send through questions to us. So you can ask questions about anything it is that you want to know about out here. Ha ha! Here's something hiding in the tree. So hidden away, I might not have spotted it if I wasn't looking really, really carefully. It's a small owl. Hey, you don't often get to see them during the day with the sun shining on him. Now you will all know this owl, it's the one that goes Oh no, sorry, no it's not. It's an owl that is called a barred owlet. It's not a pearl spotted owlet, it's a barred owlet. But it's very, very small. You know the owl that makes that sound. This is one of them. Tiny, tiny little owl watching us with his yellow eyes. And these owls come out early, early in the morning and when it starts to get dark at night. So they're not out all the time. You can see the sharp claws wrapped around the branch underneath him. And you can see him moving as the wind blows. Oh, and he's blinking at us. See how yellow his eyes are. And this is a very good bird. It's a very useful bird. It catches things like mice and rats, even sometimes small snakes. So it's a bird that is very good to have around your houses to keep away things, and even squirrels it will catch. It stops them from eating any food that they might get into. See how still he's sitting. He's going to go to sleep now. going to go to sleep and spend the rest of the day hiding here on this branch. Uh, if we look at him, because the camera makes him seem really close and very big, but if we zoom out, you can actually see how well hidden he is. Can you spot him? Just keep looking. See how well hidden away that owl is. You would never know that he's there. Just a little bit of white hiding on the branch. And there he is, watching, waiting. He's found his place to sleep. Because owls sleep during the day 
and wake up at night. Look how pretty he is. Look how pretty the feathers are. It's a little African barred owlet. He's watching us very carefully while he sits here and decides to go to sleep on his branch. We're going to carry on and we're going to see what other animals we can find you. It's starting to get much, much warmer. It was very cold this morning, but we're going to go see if we can't find some elephants. And Fionella from the Ikuruleni Center. I really want to show you a leopard. I'm going to try and see if I can't find you a leopard. We saw one yesterday and she was looking for food. And she's also got tiny, tiny, tiny cubs with her. So we're going to see if we can't find that leopard for you. I'm also looking for elephants because I can hear them breaking branches somewhere here. But I promise you I will look very hard for a leopard. But you must help me. You've got to help me look for the leopard. You've got to look for the spots and the white under the tail. And Amokulani, why was the owl not asleep? That's a very good question because he was sitting watching us. And as you know, owls like to sleep during the day. But in winter, the little owls, because that, that owl is only this big. It's very, very small. The little owls actually are in winter when it's cold like this. They're out in the early mornings and out in the late afternoons. And they do that because there's big owls during the night that might try and even hunt the smaller owls. So the little owls are out during first thing in the morning and then at night. And I think he's just going to bed now. It's kind of like he's got home at the end of a long day and he's settling down getting ready for bed and then he's going to go to sleep very soon. I'm going to... Oh! Hold on a second. Look who's hiding in here. Down in the drainage line. He is hiding. Oh! See how carefully he's hiding behind the trees. I'm sure you all know this is a Ninyala. It's an Ninyala bull. It's a male Ninyala. There you can see his horns at the back. But he's hiding from us. I know. Let's go forward a little bit and maybe we can see the other Ninyala hiding in the trees. There we go, she's peeking out. There she is, can you see her? Hiding there. Oh, this is a girl in Yala, this is a female in Yala. They're much, much lighter brown with the white stripes. And she's eating leaves of a tambuti tree, which for us is very, very poisonous. We can't eat tambuti trees. I'm sure you know you can't make fire from the wood of a tambuti either. It'll make you very sick. But for these animals, they can eat it. It's not poisonous for them. It is poisonous for us. Last station. Please go again with that update. Sorry, guys. I'm just listening to the radio in my ear. 
so that all of the other people that are driving around in the Sabi sands can tell me what they're seeing, and that if they see something amazing like a leopard or a lion, then we can drive there. Copy that, thank you. I'm just talking to a guide called a Texan, and he's helping me out trying to find things to show you. These Nyala are playing hide and seek in the thick vegetation. They don't want to be seen, so we're going to go and find a leopard, or maybe some elephants, or maybe a lion. I don't know, we can't. We don't know what we're going to find, but we're going to go see if we can find something exciting for you. And it's not just me looking. There's also a man called Steph. Let's go across to him so that he can say hello to you. Ah, yeah, Minjani. All right, that was the Shangan greeting to the school that's just joined us. And also to teach you a little bit. I'm not as good as... Uh, James is in Shangan, unfortunately. And we're back at these kudu. That is a female kudu. She doesn't have horns. The males have horns, these long corkscrew horns. Let's see if we can go forward a little bit. There's a young male that is with this group as well and we should be able to see him let's see if we can have a view, no, it's just this female giving us a oh she's beautiful they only eat leaves and they're one of the largest of the antelope that we find out here Growing to about 250 kilograms for a big male. Females like this are weighing in at about 100 to 150 kilograms. Which is about 300 to 500 pounds. You can see her just picking off the leaves using her mouth. They've got the most delicate lips. You can't believe that they strip off leaves off of branches with, with the most sort of consummate ease without the, sleep, the slightest bit of discomfort shown at any of the thorns that they get in their mouths. Right. I think a good idea, I know a good idea in actual fact, would be for you to go and have a look at the elephant that Jamie has just found. See you in a bit. Uh, look very carefully behind the trees and you'll see the elephants. We said that we could hear them eating and here they are. Also hiding away from us today but they're going to slowly come walking towards us. Look at this baby. It's such a tiny baby that it hasn't even got its tusks yet. And like those kudu with Steph, also eating a tree with thorns, but their mouths are very, very tough. So they can eat something like a sickle bush with thorns without it piercing their mouths. And look, you can tell it's still a baby by the way that it's using its trunk, the way it's using its nose to feed. It's not good at it like the adult elephants. It has to learn how to use the trunk, like babies have to learn to use their hands and to crawl and to grab things. Little baby elephants have to learn to use their trunks too. And I think our elephants are actually slowly coming towards us. And Numbuso 
Hello, welcome and good morning on your safari experience. Numbuso, yes, we do have zebra here. And I promise you I will try and find you some because they are Numbuso's favorite animal. So we will go and we will look for zebra as well. I saw lots and lots of zebra yesterday. So we'll keep an eye out for them and you can help me look for them as well. Everybody has to help me look here because there's lots of eyes watching. So we can look from there. I'm going to try and see because the elephants are slowly moving this way. I'm going to try and see if we can't put the vehicle in front of them so that they come towards us. And we don't need to be scared of the elephants. As long as we treat them with respect, they won't be dangerous to us. So we're just going to come forward. Come on, elephants. They're coming slowly, slowly into this area. See? There's lots of big grey shapes hidden. Let's just go this way a little bit. There we go. Here's another elephant. There's, and the more you look, the more elephants you'll see. It's amazing because for such a big animal, they can hide away very easily behind the trees. And when they want to be, they can be very quiet. A herd of elephants like this is led by one female. So the oldest female elephant in the group and the wisest female elephant in the group, she will lead them, tell them where to go, make sure that the little babies behave themselves, they mustn't be naughty or do anything, step out of line. And Amokulani in terms of a height of an elephant, it depends on whether we are talking a male or a female. But let me give you a good example. So, I'm not a very tall person. If I were to stand on my shoulders, or you were to stand on my shoulders, you'd probably maybe just be able to touch the top of an elephant's shoulders. So, at its tallest, you're looking at around four, maybe five meters at the shoulder. So, they're very, very tall animals. If you get them next to your house, if you find them standing next to your house, they'd be able to touch the top of your house with their trunks. Some of the big elephants, some of the big males, because the males are bigger than the females, they might even be the same height as your house at the top of their head. So they're huge animals. It's very difficult. It's only when you see them right up close that you realize just how big they are. These are young elephants that we're watching now. Probably only about, I would say maybe this one, oh, head shake. That this one is maybe, I would say 11 or so years old. Oh, she's coming to talk to us. What's wrong, girl? That's a young female. And she wants to come and join the other elephant, but she wants to make sure that we're not going to do anything scary to her. That's why she gave us that little head shake. Now you can learn to speak elephant language just like you can learn to speak any language. It's about looking at their ears and their tail and their trunk and the way that they are reacting to you. And they will speak, they will tell you what they want you to know. And for money, in terms of the female and the male elephant's weight, a male elephant is much, much bigger. A female elephant is usually around 3 tons, so 3,000 kilograms. A male elephant can go up to 6 tons, and sometimes the heaviest male elephant recorded was 10 tons, so 10,000 kilograms. That's like having... 10 of these 10 cars piled on top of each other. Now the males can be much much bigger than the females. The biggest female would probably only be about 5,000 kilograms or 5 tons. The males are 
almost in some cases double the size of the females. And also important to remember that an elephant continues to grow throughout their lives. So an elephant can live up to 60 years old. The females live slightly longer than the males, but if an elephant lives between 50 and 60 years old, so they can get very, very old. They've also got big brains, so they do a lot of learning. They're very, very clever animals. They're as clever as any animal out here. And brilliant, welcome. I hope you're enjoying these elephants. I know they're hiding away. We've just got to wait for them to start to come out. And brilliant, the elephant carries their babies for 22 months. Imagine what that must be like to be pregnant for almost two years. That's how long it takes before an elephant has a baby. And an elephant loves her baby just like a human being loves their babies because they've spent two years of their lives waiting for this baby to be born and then they look after it really really carefully so when a baby elephant is born it's tiny and it needs to be with its mom all the time to feed off her milk and she'll feed the baby elephant for even up to th when it is three years old so she'll she will give it milk right up until three years old so even longer than a human being And there we go. Simusa, you, you were wanting to know about how old an elephant can get or how long they can live for. Well, there you go. Between sort of 40 to 60 years, but they can live right up to being 60 years old. So almost, almost as long as a human being. Here we go. We're going to see the elephant now. Look, it's going to come out. Hello, elephant. Hello, elephant. So this is the young female that we saw earlier that wanted to run away from us, but now she's happy and she's comfortable. Now she came running down towards us. It's, although they look big and heavy and like they can't move very quickly, brilliant, you want to know how fast an elephant can run or how fast an elephant can move. And they can walk really, really fast. So they can move about or cover a distance of 15 meters. So when you're finished with the safari, go outside and take 15 big steps. An elephant can go in that distance, can go in one second. So from go, done. That's how fast an elephant can cover 15 meters. So they can move very, very quickly. But that makes sense because think about how long a, an elephant's legs are. Their legs are as long as I am tall, even taller than me. So they take big footsteps. And some of you may be taller than others and you'll walk faster than others. Elephants are like that. They go very, very quickly when they want to. And that's one of the big reasons why it's so important to respect elephants. And important to remember that we're in their home. Now while we watch our elephant and wait for more of them to start coming out into the open, John I hope you are having fun on safari. Oh, John, you want to know why leopards and lions can go up trees, but, oh, sorry, leopards and cheetah can go up trees, but lions can't. John, the leopards are really, really good at climbing. That's how they have adapted to escape from the lions, because big lions will actually kill leopards. And leopards also can't fight off hyena. So they can't, they can't fight away hyena, which means they have to pull their food into a tree to stop the hyena from getting it. Lions can climb trees, but they're much, much bigger than a leopard. They're heavy, heavy animals. They're built to be strong, not to be good at climbing or at jumping or at running like the leopards are. So what that means is that they can climb trees, but they fall over. So they often fall out of trees. Sorry, I can't. The sun's right in my eyes. There's an elephant coming onto the termite mound, actually, slowly but surely. Hopefully she comes out into the open. John, 
cheetah are also not so good. Look at this elephant. It's amazing. Stretching her trunk right up to the leaves there. John, cheetah also can climb trees, but they're not very good at it. They're not nearly as good as leopards are. And that's because their claws aren't as sharp as a leopard's. So their claws and their legs are not built in the same way that a leopard's is built. It does, they, their claws stay out all the time like a dog. Whereas with leopards and lions, they can actually pull their claws back into the foot to make sure that they don't get blunt. Our elephants disappeared. Luckily, our little female is still in front of us. Our brilliant is asking lots of wonderful questions about our elephants and wants to know why, how long is an elephant's trunk. Well, the amazing thing is that an elephant's trunk can actually change how long it is because it can stretch out and it can pull back in depending on what the elephant wants to do with it. Kind of like a, a spring, it can move forwards and backwards. But about between one and a half to two meters is how long an elephant's trunk is, depending on whether you're talking about a big elephant or a little elephant. This is a little elephant in front of us, and her trunk is probably only just over a meter long. But they can get right up to two meters for the big, big elephants. And the trunk is an amazing thing because it's capable of pulling down a huge branch, breaking and pushing down a big tree. And then at the same time, they can pick up something as small as a toothpick off the ground or a pencil. So they're very, very good at using their trunks. Oh, what's wrong? You see the way she decided she didn't want to eat there anymore. She's going to move on to the next tree. For money, an elephant doesn't actually sleep that much at night. Because they're so big, it's kind of like they need to eat all the time. So they're constantly, constantly feeding themselves. Imagine if you had to eat all the time. You'd just only be able to concentrate on that. So generally, adult elephants only sleep for 20 to 40 minutes during a whole day and night. So they might have a bit of a nap, maybe for five minutes at night, and then they get back up again and they carry on eating. But baby elephants can sleep for much, much longer. So just like a newborn baby needs a lot more sleep than we do, the baby elephants will actually sleep for longer. So they can sleep for up to an hour at a time. Now, did you know that an elephant can actually lie down to sleep? Now babies lie down all the time but the adults often lie down they can lie down flat but mostly they just lie against a termite mound or against a tree in order to sleep that's where they want just so that it's easy because otherwise they're so heavy that they struggle to get up so they lean against a tree or a termite mound and I've even seen an elephant go to sleep with its head resting against a marula tree And this is a big elephant. Oh, she's busy pushing over a huge tree, just showing us how strong an elephant is. And Theo, you want to know if we name these elephants? Yes, sometimes we do. Now, there are lots and lots of elephants out here that we find all of them amazing. But sometimes, Theo, we see special elephants because there's something about them that we, we, we recognize immediately. So we've got a female with a short trunk that's been caught in a bushmeat snare. You know the, the metal snares that sometimes people put out to catch, catch bushmeat? She's caught her trunk in a snare and it's cut off half of it. So we know her and we call her lots of different things. We call her Half Trunk Ellie, we call her Stumpy Trunk. She's got lots of different names, but we do name her. So 
So yes, sometimes we do name. We even have a little baby elephant called Benjamin. Can you believe that? We've got a little baby, and it's a baby elephant called Benjamin because his forehead is really, really wrinkly. Our elephants are going to disappear. Let me just try and reposition ever so slightly. There we go. Munching away. They're just enjoying their breakfast. And because an elephant eats all the time, they need to replace their teeth a lot of the time. Now you, you guys know how hot it gets in summer out here. Sorry, that was my fault. I haven't stopped the car properly. So you guys know how hot it gets out here. And Theo wanted to know what they use to protect their skin. And Theo, I actually think you know the answer to this. And you are absolutely right. If you're thinking about mud, you are absolutely right. So what elephants will do is when there is water and mud, they will go and either roll in it or they'll use their trunks to throw the mud and the dirt over them to help to protect their skin. Now their skin is very, very thick, so it, it does protect itself, but the mud and the sand also helps to coat it and protect it from the harsh beams of the sun because in midsummer you know how hot it gets and also helps to cool them down because as the mud slowly starts to dry it gets cooler and cooler so it takes away the body heat from the elephants and then of course they've got those huge ears that's basically like the elephant's fan so they flap those ears when it gets too hot and because they've got lots of blood in those ears, there you can see where all the blood runs through the ears and the veins and the capillaries. So whenever the elephant flaps his ears, then it cools him down. It cools the blood down in his ears. So an elephant's ears are like his fan. Now we've been watching our elephants eat lots of different trees here. Um, brilliant, you are again absolutely right. Elephants will only eat certain trees. They can probably eat all of the trees, but certain trees taste better to them and also certain trees have more nutrients, so are better, healthier for them. And the elephants are so clever that they know which trees they can eat and which trees they can't eat. And even more amazing than that is if the elephant feels sick or if, for example, they've got a sore tooth, if they've got toothache, they know which plants they can eat to make the, the tooth feel a bit better. So they're very, very clever. How amazing is that, that they know which, tree, which trees will actually help to make them feel better? Their instinct tells them what they can and can't eat. But at the moment, brilliant, they're eating pretty much whatever they can find because there's no, you must know that there's been no rain this year, hardly any rain. So there's hardly any food for them. So they're eating whatever trees they can find. There's no grass, and elephants do like to eat grass, but there's no grass at the moment for them to eat, so they can only eat the trees. Our elephants are hiding away. I'm going to see if we can get a better view of them. In the meantime, I'm going to send you back across to Steph to see what else he can tell you. Welcome back to the car. We've decided that we were going to leave the area where we've been searching for lions for the whole morning. It's proving to be a pointless exercise. It's just mindlessly frustrating and it doesn't really need to be. And uh, we've come back into another part of the reserve, right on the south of the reserve, where a, where a leopard that li lives, she's called Karula. She's been living in this particular area for many, many, many years, and she's the mature female leopard that lives on Juma, where we can drive around. And apparently, well, she, I know she's got two babies, but apparently what she's done is she's taken her babies across the road, and she's now come back across this road again. And that's what we're going to be doing, is we are going to be trying to find out where she's come across, why she's come across into this area. Left her babies on the side, come across onto the side. Let me show you her tracks. 
This is what I've been scanning for. So I can show you what a leopard track looks like. And in particular, this particular female's tracks. There, her tracks are right there. Show you quickly, I'll get out and show you a leopard track. This is one here. This is the back foot has stepped just into the front foot and she's now walked up here. Here's another track here and another track here and another track all the way here. And she's walked off in this direction, which is good because it allows us now to start thinking of a plan about where we're going to go and have a look for her. And it just so happens that there's a road quite close by. <laughs> it's always fortuitous here in the Sabi Sands. You always have a road close by that seems to be going in the direction that the tracks go in. That's always a good thing. Right, so let's take that. Ah, for money, you've asked me a nice question. Is it true that a cheetah can run at 120 kilometers per hour? Uh, yes, it is true. It depends on the book you read. Some are slightly slower, but 120 kilometers an hour seems to be the maximum speed that a cheetah can run. Generally, it's between 90 and 120 though, but can you imagine an animal running the same speed as cars are allowed to drive on the highway at? Hey, incredible, hey? And they do that because they've got very, very big muscles in their legs, a very deep chest so their lungs can expand, a big heart that can pump blood all the way through their body like it needs to, a very flexible spine, and at the end of their toes, they've got claws that do not go inside like cats do. They stick out. And as the cheetah runs, it can dig its claws into the ground and it can actually push off with a lot more force. Nice, eh? Hey? Alright, now this particular leopard that we're looking for does walk around during the day. Now, unlike cheetah, which are generally daytime hunters and using their speed to catch food, leopard are generally nighttime hunters that use stealth and camouflage and concealment to catch their food, pouncing on their food when it's close to them. Ah. For money, you've asked another question about cheetah. You look like you like cheetah. Is it your favorite animal? You've asked me how long do cheetah... Oh, we've got some impala having a bit of a fight here with one another. What's happening, you two? Impala fighting with one another. I'll answer your question now for money. Impala fighting with one another would call this leopard in from hundreds of meters away. While they distracted with each other, they make for excellent targets. They're just jousting with one another at the moment. I don't know why they're fighting with one another. The rut is, is over. Ended in about the middle of May this year. But it looks like these are having a bit of a tussle. Now for money, you wanted to know how long cheetah sleep in the day. Now, they sleep probably a couple of hours a day. Oh, look at these guys. They really are having a bit of a box with one another. Mostly at night time. There we go. You saw that joust in a check. One was trying to create an opening. The other one blocked it. And now the larger one is pushing the smaller one away. That head bowing, that is quite typical of male impala that where one is losing, it's a submissive behavior. The bigger one now is the one that's closest to us. See what they're going to do. See if they 
bump into one another again. Now, of course, if they've been at it for some time, I've seen this particular leopard, but I've seen other leopard as well react. See, that was an alarm call. There we go. What is that now? Why are you doing that? That was an alarm call. They might be smelling something rather than seeing something, though. That, to me, didn't sound like it was an alarm call for, for animals that they're seeing. It's something they're smelling. Sunrise, you've asked me what the difference is between a leopard and a cheetah. I'm going to see if I can actually find you a picture because it's easier described in a picture. While we're busy having a look at what these two male impala are shouting about, I'll try and make a, I'll try and find a picture quickly of a leopard and a cheetah. I think I have one in my box of tricks here. All right, I have a book here which will allow us to do exactly that. I think I have. There we go. There's a cheetah. So, a leopard. This is a leopard. Oh, he's in Paula. With these leopard tracks that are so close to us, I think we have got a leopard here somewhere, but we're just going to stand right where we are. This is a leopard. You'll notice that the spots on the body are rosettes with a darker brown in the middle. And then surrounded by white. Have a look at that. Quite powerful in the shoulders. Quite powerful in the back with a deep barrel body. And a round tail. Alright. Are we going to go across to a cheetah? A cheetah, you can see, has dots. Not rosettes. And a cheetah also has teardrops on the face. You see those dark marks on the face that a leopard doesn't have? And a cheetah's tail is flattened on the end like a paddle. Alright, these impala are now giving big alarm calls here. I'm going to pack away my book. Are we going to give some attention to the bush around us now? Oh, what? These impala are barking about why are they so nervous. They tend to give that alarm call when there's a predator around and with. The fact that these female leopard tracks are so fresh in the area and they are fighting. Stick with these impala. I think whatever this leopard is doing, it's probably making his way to these young bucks. They've now run off. Anyway, they've run off. We're going to carry on looking for this leopard in this particular area. Jamie, I think, has got some more elephants to show you. Hopefully, Steph manages to find the leopard for all of us. Hiding somewhere in the bushes. Maybe the impala have spotted it. In the meantime, we've still got our elephants, but they are playing very hard to get. They're hiding behind the trees and getting a view of them is very difficult. Now, I don't think we actually have a view of them anymore. They have moved on. So we'll try and go forward a little bit, see if we can't see our elephant. There we go, we've got one of our elephants. Let's come out into the open. And Theo, yes, an elephant's very, very clever. An elephant's waste can be used as a fertilizer. So an elephant eats lots and lots and lots of food, but their stomachs aren't very good at digesting it. So they actually end up w basically excreting or defecating out about half of what they eat. And that in turn is got, has got lots and lots of nutrients in it. So you can use it as a fertilizer. It's a very good idea. And in fact, some of the trees out here actually do use it as a fertilizer. Elephants are not very good at chewing their food. Now, you will all have eaten marula fruit before, so you know how nice marula fruit is. Elephants like to eat marula fruit as well. Though when they eat the marula fruit, sometimes they don't chew the seeds. 
and then it comes out in their waste and then the marula tree seed can actually use it as a fertilizer to grow which is why you often find baby marula trees grow in piles of elephant waste. I think that the birds are sounding very very cross. I wonder if the elephant is not eating close to their nest site where they've got their babies hidden because I can hear the birds getting really really cross. Look at it push the tree branch over. I've said that you can see now this elephant is showing us just how strong it is. And I've said that we've got to be really respectful of these elephants because we are living in their home and not the other way around. They, we are in their home. And Theo, you wanted to know what would happen if an elephant sees you in the bush. It depends on the elephant. Now no, no elephant wants to kill people, but some of them, because it's been lots and lots of years that they have learned that people mean trouble, which means they get very scared of people if you find them on foot. Especially if it's a group of females with their babies because they're worried about protecting their babies. So they might do one of two things. They might run away, which is usually the case, or they might actually come towards you to make sure that you are not going to do anything to hurt them. And then it's important never to run away from them because if you run away from them, then it's like they have won and they often chase if you run away. So it's important to get to nice high ground, find yourself a big termite mound and get yourself somewhere where there's something big in between you and the elephant. The big males, on the other hand, sometimes they're actually relatively relaxed with people on foot. And if you know what you're doing and you do it very carefully, you can sit and watch them. And because they're so big and there's nothing much out here that can hurt them, they actually don't feel too frightened of us. But then sometimes there are male elephants that get very cross when people are around and they come running at you. And then again, it's very important not to run away from them. Otherwise, they, le they chase you. But most of the time, it's just important you walk carefully in the bush. If you see an elephant, uh, then you must move away from it, go in the other direction and make sure that you don't frighten it because it's when they're frightened that they get dangerous. And for money, when the elephant is eating, you want to know how long it takes for it to digest its food. Elephants actually digest their food really, really quickly. So I said that they, they defecate out, or about half of what they eat comes out as waste. Between a third and a half comes out as waste. They actually digest in a day. So from the mouth to the waste products, that happens in 24 hours and it comes back out again. Sometimes, especially for the baby elephants that drink their mother's milk as well, that can happen even faster than that. So they digest very quickly. That's also why they're so thirsty. How brilliant. These elephants are incredibly strong. This is just a young female, and this is an even smaller baby. But Brilliant wants to know what is the strength of this elephant. Brilliant, if it wanted to, because this elephant probably weighs more than the, this car, plus me and Jandre, and Jandre is the man who directs the camera. So this elephant could push the car over without even thinking about it. They are so strong, they can push down big trees, if they want to. Hello, baby. Look how cute this baby is. Hasn't even grown his tusks yet. And he's busy searching under the ground for any roots that he can find.
And Amukilani? No. We've, spe we've been talking about how strong an elephant is. No, Asian elephants are not stronger than the African elephants. African elephants are bigger and they are stronger than the Asian elephants. Especially in these areas, they're much, much bigger. Look at this baby with its ears out open. Busy looking to see, making sure that there's nothing scary where it's walking. Now the herd is very, very important to all of these elephants and they are all related to each other. So it might be mothers, cousins, sisters, aunts, all like that. And Theo, yes, the elephants do work together to protect each other and to keep each other safe. Let's go forward a little bit. I think that they will be happy with us doing that. And yes, Theo, elephants will work together. The big females actually protect the rest of their herd and their babies. They work very, very hard in protecting them. Let's just stop here. I don't want to get too much closer in case we scare them. Now some of these elephants have been digging down to get underneath the grass and the trees that they've been feeding on. And yes, Theo, an elephant does eat the roots of a tree. In fact, during these winter months when it's drought, they actually spend most of their time, or a lot of their time, digging out roots and bulbs and anything they can find underground. And this is exactly how they do it. See how he's using his feet to move the sand and then sniffing with his trunk? And an elephant can dig very deep underneath the surface of the ground. And if he can't dig the root out, then what they'll do is, just like what we were talking about earlier, they'll actually push the whole tree over. We're going to watch him dig for a little bit and then I want to show you the tree that the elephants have pushed over to eat the roots. But let's see if what he's found. Look, he's found some grass roots and that's where, especially in winter, the plants keep all of the food that they have made and that they have stored and also lots of water as well. So that's why elephants, especially in winter, will spend a lot of time digging under the ground to get to the parts of the plant that are underneath the surface of the soil. See, there he goes, he's found what he wants, then he sweeps it with his trunk to get rid of the dirt and the dust. Because elephants don't really like eating sand. Nobody likes eating sand, but elephants definitely don't. Look at how beautiful they are. You see those long eyelashes digging away. You can even see while he digs, you can even, if you look closely, you can see his toenails. Toenails just like us. There you go. See the toenails there to use for digging? We spoke about how fast an elephant can go and that it can run um, 15 meters per second <laughs> in any direction. Nikiwe, you wanted to know why or how an elephant can move so quickly because it's such a big animal. And the answer is because, because it's big. It's not fat. It's big. It's got lots and lots of very big muscles. And they've also got really long legs. So each time an elephant takes a step, we would have to take two, maybe three steps to keep up with them. So for an elephant, all they've got to do is stretch out those long legs and move, and they cover huge distances. He's still eating the root. Oh, this is what I wanted to show you. Sorry, I wanted to show you this big tree. 
if you have a look at this huge tree here, this has been pushed over by an elephant. It is a buffalo thorn, and the elephants have pushed it over to eat the roots at the bottom there, and then also to get to the fresh green leaves on the top of the tree. Now this tree has been pushed over by an elephant, and it's a very big tree. So it just shows you how strong an elephant really is. Very, very strong animals. They're able to push over something like that. Now, Dathri, while we watch our elephants busy feeding, if we watch carefully, we might even be lucky enough to see one of them sleep because you wanted to know where they sleep and the answer is they actually sleep pretty much wherever they want to. Oh, look at this big one pushing the little one away. It wants to eat there, so it just pushed the little one away. Like a bully. So elephants sleep wherever they want to. And what will happen is we spoke about how important the herd is and how protective and how they work as a team. So when the babies want to go to sleep, then all of the females in the herd, the big females, the adults, will come and walk around the baby, form a circle around the sleeping babies, and then they will just stand there and wait for the baby to finish sleeping. And elephants will also take turns to sleep so that some one of the elephants is always watching for trouble or anything that might be dangerous for the elephants. And these young elephants also spend a lot of their time looking after the babies. So when an elephant gets to about four or five years old, maybe even six or seven, their mom will have a, another calf and they will practice taking care of that baby. But like you look after your younger brothers or your younger sisters, elephants will do the same thing. They look after their younger siblings very carefully. And look closely, you can see the white stuff in the corner of his eye. That's to protect it against the dust. Now this is a herd that is just full of babies and big females, big adult females. But Formani was wanted to know what time the elephants will meet to mate. And the, the answer is, again, it's kind of like with their sleeping, they don't have a set time of year. Now impala you know have a set time of year, certain animals have a set time of year. But elephants are like dogs in that dogs and cats in that they can mate any time of the year. So what will happen is the female goes into heat and the males from that are around in the area will come and join up with the herd and then one of them, the biggest, usually the biggest one, will get to mate with her and make a baby just like that. Look at that little one at the back there. Oh, I think that elephant's going to block it. Look, it's on the, on the corner of the wall. Looks like it might fall down. <laughs> it's bending down. It wants to go across. Careful. There we go. Running back across to where mom is. That's a very young baby. It's probably only about a year old. I'm sure while we've been watching our elephants, you must be wondering how Steph is getting on looking for the leopard. Let's go across to him so that we can find out. Yes, we have been looking for this female leopard. We went to go and check a dam that was close by called Treehouse Dam. It's empty at the moment, but there are still some of those impala around. There was also some kudu around there. And as we got to the dam, we heard all these alarm calls from a, a family of dwarf mongoose, tiny little predators like this. And we drove past and then something in my brain just said, let's just go and see exactly what's made these dwarf mongoose cry like that. And as we drove up thinking that this leopard was going to jump out of the bush, boom, an African hawk eagle, one of the eagles out here that hunt dwarf mongoose, flew up from the ground. It would obviously be trying to hunt one of these dwarf mongoose unsuccessfully because it flew away with nothing in its talons 
and then we carried on going and that's exactly where you catch us now is basically just fine combing the roads where we are to try and see where those tracks of that leopard come out it's exactly in the line that she was walking and leopard tend to walk in a straight line i do know that this particular female leopard that we're walking or that we're tracking at the moment loves to walk from bush to bush from thicket to thicket so although she walks in a straight vector in a direction she does so in a zigzag passion of fashion walking from one thick bush to one thick bush to one thick bush don't quite know why i think obviously she's just learnt it it's leopard can learn habits depending on whatever's uh, best suited to her in the area from a prey point of view and she's obviously learnt this habit of walking from thicket to thicket it works for her now what we're going to do is we're going to go down a road called Ingwe Alley one of my favorite roads here at Juma it is still in the line of travel albeit a little bit further away from where we saw those tracks I haven't seen any tracks crossing the road or walking on the road barring those ones that I showed you a little bit earlier now that in itself doesn't mean much Ah, and Theo has asked, is a cheetah ever friendly with a leopard? Theo, in my experience, I'm going to say no. They compete with one another for the same food source. So they both like the same sized animals to eat. Leopard and cheetah, they fight with one another over the same food source. And although one is supposed to hunt in the dark and one is supposed to hunt in the day, one is supposed to be in thicker bush and one is supposed to be in more open bush my experience with cheetah and leopard is that they do fight with one another from time to time with the leopard being the more stockier of the two the heavier in the chest and the heavier in the shoulders and arguably the better fighter as well and in the encounters that i've seen between leopard and cheetah the leopard has has always won unfortunately I was also privy to witnessing a leopard killing a cheetah's baby the leopard came out of the bush to try and steal an impala that the cheetah had killed the baby didn't see the leopard until the last minute and the leopard gave it one almighty smack and unfortunately killed that cheetah's baby right in front of me it was a sad day but I've only seen that once so it doesn't happen very often but nevertheless it does still happen as sad as what it is I would say though that cheetah are definitely the better hunters than what leopard are if you look at a success rate leopard are only successful about two out of every ten times that they hunt whereas cheetah are successful roughly eight to nine times out of every ten times that they hunt nice statistic that eh? The cheetah, super, super skilled at catching their sized prey. Their bodies have evolved this massive speed, highly agile, daytime hunters, big eyes, big way of cooling themselves down. Leopard are definitely more versatile. Definitely more versatile. They can live in, in, in a wider gap of, of habitats. They can occupy more niches. We have some zebra in front of us. Let's see if we can show them to you. I'm just spying one zebra through the bush there. Let's see and get a little bit closer to him. Ah, and Amokalani has made it known to us that zebra are her favorite animal then Amokalani I'm glad that I can show you one there's one right here two in actual fact that I can see it's there we go let's see if we can get a little bit closer for you uh, it's difficult to sneak up on animals in a car as big as what this is but we're gonna try and see what we can do for you so I'm sneaking now behind this bush there we go three zebra just for you this 
standing amongst a whole herd of impala. Let's see if I can tell you if they're male or female. So the one closest to us on the right hand side is a male. The one standing next to him on the left hand side is a female. And the one right in front is another male. Sorry, I changed that. Two females at the back and a male in the front. Quite difficult with zebra to tell the difference actually. We're looking at zebras that are in good condition here though. Now zebras are really quite hardy animals. They can live on a, on a wide variety of grass that is not, doesn't need to be perfect. Unlike the impala that you see around that really need a very good quality grass to survive, these zebra can literally live on almost anything. Look at that one scratching his armpit there. Using the branch as a loofah to get at all those hard to reach places. Zebra enjoy a good scratch from time to time. Let's see if she scratches her bum as well. No. <laughs> Sometimes you find them doing that same as warthogs. I must say, the threat of that cold front that was around a little bit earlier seems to have disappeared. There's no more wind, not a breath of air. Actually, a little bit of a breath of air, but not much. And all those clouds have disappeared. So, if that was the cold front, then that's over. Sort of the limit of our bad weather out here. There we go, that one's scratching... Her bum. <laughs> uh, I don't even make fun of them, but it is quite comical. <laughs> Must be difficult when you don't have hands. <laughs> they carry a lot of parasites. Not so many as, say, a buffalo would or an eland or a giraffe even. But definitely in those hard-to-reach places. <laughs> the back leg's coming up. And here we have another zebra that's just come in from the right-hand side. And it gives me a chance for you... For to, or to explain a question that Nikiwe has just asked about why a zebra is black and white. Nikiwe, nobody really knows why zebra are black and white. They do think that it's got something to do with confusing predators. That their stripes and their shadows, their counter shading, confuses predators when they're in a bunch as to picking out which one. Predators often focus on the weakest link in any herd. They, they, they're drawn to the weakest link. But when you've got so many confusing colors going backwards and forwards and milling about one another, it makes it very difficult for a predator who doesn't see in color like we do, they see in shades of gray, to pick out one individual from another and to decide on what prey to actually pick. Does it help? No. Uh, Zebra still form quite a big part of lion's diet out here. So I would say that although that is a plausible theory or a hypothesis, to me I think it's got a little bit to do with, could be almost anything, it could be heat reduction, way to dissipate heat, it could be a sign perhaps, I don't know, something that the ladies find sexy, who knows. <laughs> <laughs> but talking about colorful animals, Jamie's got a very colorful bird that we're going to send you to before it flies away. Unfortunately, my colorful bird flew away, but luckily we still have some gray elephants for you. And in this case, she is busy eating a tree called a leadwood tree, which has some very hard thorns that she's putting into her mouth, but it doesn't seem to bother her. Elephants are amazing that way, what they can eat and without hurting themselves. Now look how she uses her trunk 
to grab things and put them in her mouth. Now, what she will also do is she will use her tusks to help her with this whole process. So there she's wrapping her trunk around. It's easy, a bit easier to break it off. But there, see her tusk? You see how there's a big groove in it on the end? There on the edge there. That comes from using her tusk perfect. Thank you, Jandre. That comes from using that tusk to help her break branches. So what she does is she grabs it with her trunk and then she wraps it round the tusk and then she pulls her head up and she cuts through the branches using that tusk. Now see how it's on one but not the other. So it's on her right hand tusk but not her left hand tusk. And that is because elephants have left and right hands like we do. Some of us write with our left hand, some of us write with our right hand. Elephants are the same. They use one tusk more than the other. Just like a human being is right-handed and left-handed. At the moment, though, she's just pulling the branches straight off and putting them straight into her mouth. A very hungry elephant. And there you can see how that trunk can bend in every direction. It doesn't have any bones in it. So our arms, we can only bend our arms in one direction. We can bend our elbows straight in and we can bend our wrists towards our elbows, but we can't bend our arm in the opposite direction. Elephants' trunks are even better than human arms because they can go backwards, forwards, sideways, up, down. They can curl in, they can stretch up like she's doing now, grabbing the branches at the top there and pulling them into her mouth. An elephant trunk is an amazing thing. Don't forget that the tusks of an elephant are their teeth. It's a special type of tooth. And just uh, by the way, for some of our regular viewers, I just had the most hilarious update from Taxon. <laughs> so... Taxon said that the lioness came to join him and his guests at his drink stop. <laughs> so a lion just walked into where Taxon, one of the guys, had got all of his guests out of the car to have their morning coffee. And the lioness walked in and they had to pack up all their coffee and get back into the car. But maybe she just wanted some coffee too. And brilliant, while we look at the elephant's ears, he wanted to know how many liters of blood is an, an elephant's ears. Well, just remember, of course, that the it's constantly changing because the blood is constantly pumping through there. But it probably, depending on the size of the elephant, whether it's a big elephant or a little elephant, it's somewhere between about five or so liters. Five or so liters is probably an average. Might be a bit more in the really big elephants. And there's lots and lots of blood in those ears. And as we said, it's to help cool the elephant down. Here, you can even see the elephant's eye now. It's got long, long eyelashes to protect it from the thorns. And they've got brown eyes. All elephants have brown eyes. You can see how the outside of her mouth is stained green from all of the leaves that she's been eating. Now, an elephant doesn't see all that well, but they can hear really, really clearly. Their sense of hearing and their sense of smell is much better than ours. So for Marnie, yes, an elephant can hear really far away much, much further than we can hear, possibly even 20, maybe even f more kilometers away they can hear a sound, depending on how loud it is. And here's the amazing thing. Elephants can talk to each other over tens of kilometers, so big distances, by doing a deep rumble, so deep that we can't even hear it. And then they pick up the sound through their feet, 
How amazing is that? So the deep vibrating rumble, it makes the ground vibrate. You know when you get a loud noise and you can feel it in your body? Elephants do that and they can talk to each other over really, really long distances that way. And they do talk to each other because even if it's not part of, if they're not part of the same herd, they're still communicating with other elephants in the area. Let's go forward a little bit because I think we might have a nice view of these elephants here. As you can see, we're driving in a riverbed. And Urula, you wanted to know why an elephant eats plants. And I can see what you mean because it's such a big animal. Why is it that it eats plants and not something else like meat maybe? And Urula, the answer is because it's such a big animal. And we spoke about how it needs to eat almost constantly in order to stay as big as it is, in order to survive. Now, there's only one thing out here that there are lots of, and that is plants. So, an elephant has to eat trees and grass, because if it ate meat, there wouldn't be any animals left to feed it. But with plants, it can eat and eat and eat all day, and there will still be some plants left over. There'll still be lots of plants left over. But if an elephant, imagine if an elephant ate impala, or zebra, one elephant would have to eat a whole impala all to itself and it would have to eat that every single day. There'd be no animals left. So that's why an elephant eats plants because there's enough plants to feed the elephants and that's what their teeth are ready for. And also they're such big animals that they wouldn't be able to catch anything else. Everything else here is much faster than an elephant. And looking at our beautiful African elephants, Nikiwe, we were speaking before about the fact that an elephant has lots and lots of blood in their ears. But you want to know why do they have such big ears? Now they have big ears because the bigger their ears, the more blood they can put through them. Now you know how if you get hot, if you get hot and you wave your hand in front of your face, it doesn't produce much air. It kind of doesn't really cool you down. So let's say you're waving your hand in front of your face. So if you're doing it like this, it doesn't produce much, very much air. But let's say now you've got a piece of paper or a book. This is too big a book, but you do something like this with a piece of paper. You know how it makes more air, so it cools you down faster. And elephant's ears are like that, so they're really, really big, so that they can create lots of air moving around it, so that it works like an elephant's fan to help keep it cool. That's why elephants have such big ears. And crisp talking about how fast elephants can go. An elephant can run at between 40 to 45 kilometers per hour. Now that's really very, very fast. They can actually run a little bit faster than that, but not for very long. So an elephant can't really run all that fast, but they do just by walking. Because their legs are so long, an elephant walks at around 15 kilometers per hour possibly even more if it's feeling like it wants to walk quite fast if it's feeling thirsty for example that's just walking that's not even running just a walking pace for us that's like us jogging we'd have to jog to keep up with an elephant that was walking looking absolutely beautiful in the morning sun.
and a very warm welcome to Tiki Tai, who is a new viewer. It's great to have you on board with us on our Sunrise Safari. And don't forget, we do do this twice a day, every single day. This morning's been a very special show for some of the kids in the local schools. But we're out here every single day. Why are elephants grey? And why are their eyes brown? Well, grey is a very, it's a very good colour for them because it doesn't, this, it means that the skin is protected by a suitable amount of melanin so that it, especially for such a large animal, so that it does, they don't get sunburned. So albino elephants generally don't survive because they get sunburned. Whereas if they were black, they would get too hot because their color would be too dark. So gray is the perfect in-between color to make sure that, or to help with a temperature control within an elephant. That's a sort of very basic answer. Their, their eyes are brown because, again, um, if their eyes were a lighter color, almost all of the animals out here have brown, daytime animals that is, have brown eyes to reduce the amount of glare that they experience because light colored eyes struggle with bright sunlight. Okay, time for us to finish off our safari and a big goodbye to the kids at the Ikuruleni Center in the Tinsualu area. It's been wonderful having you guys on board. I hope that you have a that you do come back and join us on safari once again. Thank you to Jandre for his wonderful camera work as always. Here it comes his thumb as well as to Lou and Chelsea in final control. Most importantly, thank you to all of our viewers across the globe. We will catch up with you for the sunset safari. Until then, I hope you have a marvelous day or night wherever you are. We'll catch you then. Bye-bye everybody. Side. We do. Some of us write with our left hand, some of us write with our right hand.